All right, good morning. We're gonna go ahead and get started. It's five after. Um, I'm Kira Larson. I think I've met all of you here. Um, Education Program Manager in the Stanford Center for Clinical Research. Welcome. Uh, I'm really excited. I'm, I'm always excited about these classes. I really like putting them on and hosting them, meeting new people, but I'm really excited about this topic today. So thanks for coming. I think many of you are, feel the same um, as I do about this topic in particular. So um, I don't have too many announcements. There is a sign-in sheet that's around right here in the back um, table. So if you could circulate throughout the class and make sure to sign in or sign in before you leave. There is um, coffee and water and some yummy pastries in the back, so please help yourself to breakfast. Um, the next science series is um, gonna be an overview of pain research that's um, set for mid-September, and I'll be creating that flyer um, over the next week, and we'll send that out. Um, we have a PhD, uh, Dr. Katie Martucci, who's gonna be doing that lecture from the Division of Pain. So I will just take a few minutes to introduce our speaker for today. Um, Laura Yamagata has agreed to do this. Um, we've been in communication the first time we're meeting today, but we've been in communication about this for four or five months, months something yeah. like that. <laughs> so um, she obtained her Bachelor of Science degree in Global Health and Geospatial Analysis from the University of California at Berkeley in 2010. And she's worked okay. as <laughs> Don't eat. Yeah, right. <laughs> she has worked as a research intern, medical assistant at Bay Area Foot and Laser Podiatry Clinic, and as a transplant data analyst supervisor at UCSF. For the last six years, she's worked as the organ placement coordinator for Donor Network West. And and Laura's gonna talk to us more about Donor Network West, which is the third largest federally designated organ procurement organization. In this role, she manages the organ allocation process, minimizing risk of organ loss, and maximizing opportunities for transplantation. She also works as a surgical first assistant for the Sierra Donor Services and Donor Network West, participating in preoperative timeouts, prepping and positioning the patients for surgery, and provides surgical support and assistance to the transplant surgeon throughout the organ recovery operation. So please welcome her to Stanford today, even though you went to Cal. I <laughs> Little healthy competition, nothing wrong with that. Uh, good morning, how is everybody today? Good. Uh, well, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm, I'm pretty casual with speaking, so if you guys have questions, feel free to kind of chime in. If it's something that we're gonna get to a little bit later, I'll let you know, um, but then we'll have time afterward for questions and everything. Um, so I think everybody's heard of the phrase, there's no such thing as bad publicity, right? But I think that that only really applies in certain situations. So I want you to keep that in mind as you watch this next clip. We'll talk about it after. Dad? Traffic violation. What's wrong with you, kid? I need a new liver and a new intestine. Yeah? One mine? I can't have that nice man's organs. He offered. You know how in school, the rules you have to follow? The same goes for here. We have to follow the rules or else we get in big trouble. And what that man offered you was definitely against the rules. No, no. She's fighting with the insurance people again. Are you not supposed to worry about stuff like that? No. Tell her something good today. Even if nothing good happens. She needs good news. I've got a body full of, of high quality parts here. Three day liquidation sale. Everything must go. Even if we could do it, you have to be a match for him. Which means we have to cross match your blood with his. Good thing we're both in a hospital then. The boy who needs organs, I presume, wants to live. And me, I have organs. I'm ready to die. We've removed a piece of your skull. Which means your brain is now only covered by dura matter. It's virtually exposed. If somehow that area were to be damaged, it would cause intracranial bleeding, which would cause your brain to swell worse than it did today. 
which would result in brain death. So as your doctor, I need you to be very careful not to damage it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Try adjusting the height of the drip chamber and let's raise this bed up another 10 degrees. What will that do? Not much. Jackson. Jackson, you listen to mommy. It is not time. You do not get to go yet. You have to stay here with me. You hear me? You stay with mommy. It is not time. I need to fight. I need to fight, Jackson. I need you to stop. I need you to put down the scalpel. This man is trying to kill himself, and God forgive me, I need you to... You need to leave my OR, Dr. Bailey. In five days. In five days, this man is going to die, and his organs are going to go with him. They'll be buried with his body, and they'll rot in the ground, and that is a crime. It's a crime against life. It's only five days. That's it. That's all we're taking from him, and he doesn't want them anyway. You took an oath, Miranda. No. That I know. We took an oath. But right now, that oath makes no sense. It makes no sense. It doesn't. So just stop. Just stop. Don't do anything else for this man. stop this surgery. It's the same as me sticking this scalpel into his brain. Is that what you want? Yes, that's what I want. It's a long shot. Just go. Uh -huh. Whatever Bailey's doing, I hope to hell she's having better luck than we are. He's hemorrhaging through his craniectomy. Should I at least put in a subdural drain? That's up to Dr. Bailey. Dr. Bailey? Dr. Bailey should have put in a drain? No. There's a lot of bleeding. We should really do something. Similar. I am aware of that, Dr. Yang, sir, really soon. So that was from a little known show called Grey's Anatomy. Some of you may have heard of it. But never mind the fact that Dr. Bailey goes wandering into an OR without a mask. There's, there's lots of things wrong with that, right? And the biggest thing is that that's a show seen by millions of people. It's on a major network. And this is what people hear about donation. This is what they think about donation. And so if they don't go and do any other research on their own, that's all that they're going to think about it. So then you have things like these, articles like these, that come out in really highly publicized uh, publications. Like you have the New York Times, you have all these articles talking about the dark side of donation, calling transplant surgeons vultures. There's, there's a lot of negative energy associated with donation. Um, but because I have a better idea of how it works, these are the kinds of stories that I see. And these are the kinds of stories that my friends and my colleagues share. And so when I think about donation, these are the kinds of things that I think about. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Bingham family. Uh, Jason and Stacy Bingham have five beautiful children. Um, all of them have either suffered from dilated cardiomyopathy or they show signs of potentially developing it one day. Um, and the three children on the left have all received heart transplants here at Packard. 
Um, the littlest one, Gage Bingham in the middle, was just transplanted earlier this year. Uh, and the eldest on the far left side has received two heart transplants because of her condition here. So Stanford, obviously a great center, Packard as well. But I want to talk about some myths about donation because I think that there's a lot of misinformation out there and I think it's really important that we all educate ourselves about it and then we can go out and tell people what's actually true. So does anybody want to share a myth that they've heard about donations, something that they've heard that they think might be true or not true? Anybody? Donation always goes to wealth. Yeah, that's a good one. I've definitely heard that. Anything else? Okay. Oh, sorry. So, funny little cartoon. We're doing a heart transplant and you brought me a kidney. We'll just have to make do. It's not quite how it works. So I wanna talk about some myths about donations, some really common things that we hear all the time. So I don't know if you guys have seen uh, Superbad, McLovin. McLovin is a donor. Uh, but one of the biggest myths that we commonly hear is that the hospital is not going to save your life if they see a donor dot on your license. So you are in a motor vehicle crash somewhere out in the field and you get brought in and as the paramedics or whoever are looking for your identification, they see a donor dot on your license. You get brought into the ER and everybody's like, oh, well, the patient signed up to be a donor. We're just going to let it go. It'll be fine. That's not how it works at all. The hospital's main priority is absolutely and always to save your life. That is their only agenda. That is the only thing that they care about. Transplant, if it happens, is a completely separate process. So bottom line, absolutely false. Another one that we hear, um, in, I work in sort of a, a call center-ish environment, but we get a lot of calls from people, uh, just members of the public, um, and I get people calling in all the time saying, oh, I, I signed up to be a donor, but I don't really want to do it anymore. I, I think I have too many health conditions. I, I don't think anybody would want my organs. Um, or you have patients, or you have people calling about loved ones of theirs that are maybe in the hospital or in some sort of end of life care um, that decide that they want to unregister their person because they don't think that there's any potential there. Um, so a lot of people rule themselves off, out for donation, which I think is a big mistake. Um, it may or may not surprise you to know that a lot of our donors have long-standing chronic illnesses like hypertension or diabetes. We have donors all the time that have long-standing history of hypertension over 20 years, diabetes, same thing, a lot of chronic conditions. Um, we also have a lot of donors that have communicable diseases like hep C, hep D. That doesn't mean that you can't be a donor. Um, and because of the HOPE Act, uh, there are some programs that are participating in transplanting uh, HIV positive organs into HIV positive recipients. So that's a really great way that everybody is looking at uh, trying to expand the donor pool. So it's always our recommendation to leave the assessment to the professionals because we'll be able to make a better assessment as to whether or not uh, your organs may actually be viable. Um, in a presentation in one of our education forums at Donor Network West, our medical director said, I think it was something like 80% of heavy drinkers don't actually develop fatty liver disease associated with heavy drinking that we kind of naturally think about. So I went home and had a glass of wine to celebrate, but <laughs> never mind. So this is a great myth that we also hear that the rich and famous are unfairly given priority on the wait list. So I don't think anybody actually knows how long Steve Jobs was actually waiting for a transplant, but rather than getting transplanted, here at Stanford, which would seem like it'd be the logical choice, he was actually transplanted in Tennessee. There's a reason that that happened really quickly, um, and we'll go into that a little bit more. But the average waiting time for a liver in the U.S. can vary greatly just depending on what transplant center you're at, what geographic area you're in. Um, there's a lot of discrepancies, or there's a lot of variability in, uh, in volumes at transplant centers. Like UCSF, for example, has a 5,000 plus person waiting list. Over in Tennessee, at the transplant center that he got transplanted at, it may be a lot smaller. And so if he's the sickest patient on the list, then he would pop up to the top. And so it's not really that they're given priority, but having the means to be able to get to another transplant center where maybe you're the sickest person, it's definitely helpful and it gives that perception. Well, let's talk about some actual facts about donation. So I'm not gonna go through all of the specific numbers, but it's very clear that a ton of people need transplants. And we do have a lot of donors, but there just, there aren't enough. And there aren't enough organs being transplanted every year in order to meet the, the need for people uh, that actually need transplants. 
And so you can see that the number of donors and the number of transplants being performed every year has been pretty steady since 2003, but the number of people needing transplants has gone up a lot. Um, and so let's talk about the different kinds of things that you can donate. So on the organ side, which is where I work, um, you can donate your heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, small intestine, and pancreas. Uh, and on the tissue side, which unfortunately I don't know as much about, so I can't really speak to that, uh, they do donate tissue um, like corneas, tendons, heart valves, if that doesn't go for transplant, uh, veins, skin, and bones, uh, including cartilage. And then you can also be both a living donor and uh, a deceased donor as well. Uh, does anybody know what you can donate if you're a living donor? Kidneys, anything else? Liver, there's one more. I don't know if you can be a living skin donor. They can, they can do grafts from, yeah, that's true, yeah. Um, you can also be a living lung donor, which is definitely less common. Uh, and we don't see that as much, but that is also something that happens. So there's two kinds of donation primarily. There's deceased and there's living donation, but we're primarily gonna be talking about deceased donation today. Um, but I think it's important to touch on living donation as well. So transplant centers are always looking for ways to maximize donation because the need is so great and the number of organs that are available is so small relatively. So some of the ways that this is addressed is by split livers. So instead of transplanting one whole liver into one recipient, you can split the liver into segments. And that can either go from an adult to a pediatric and an adult patient, or a pediatric patient can transplant to other pediatric recipients. Um, and that can be done as a living or a deceased donor. As a living donor, you would donate a segment of your liver to your recipient, and then there, the liver eventually would grow to, I think, nearly full size and your, liver, your donor liver would also regrow as well. Um, kidneys, there's, um, there's something called pediatric on block kidneys, which are typically from donors that are less than 12 kilos. So they're really small, they're like the size of quarters. Um, and typically these kidneys get overlooked because they're so small, um, it takes a very specific type of recipient that's able to receive that transplant. And so typically you're looking for um, smaller recipients because typically the the width of the aorta is about the, the size of your thumb or so. And so in a pediatric donor, the aorta is less than half a centimeter. It's super, super tiny. And that is even smaller than the typical renal artery. And so you're putting two tiny little kidneys into, into a very small adult who doesn't have that, need, that high need for clearance, um, for creatinine clearance. Um, typically, they are not used in pediatric patients uh, just because the transplanting both kidneys into a tiny little baby. There's just not enough room in the abdominal cavity to do that. Um, there's also something called on-block kidneys or two for one or duals. Um, and these are kidneys from adult donors usually. Um, and they are individually not functioning so great on their own, but um, you can transplant both kidneys into a recipient who again, doesn't have a really high creatinine clearance need uh, and they'll function sort of as well in the place of, of one sort of regularly functioning donor kidney. Um, something that I thought was really interesting is that when you get a kidney transplant, they don't remove your native kidneys unless you have a disease like polycystic kidney disease or something where there's just no room in your abdomen to, to do the transplant. So if you received on block kidneys or you received dual kidneys as your transplant, you have four functioning kidneys in your body. That's pretty cool. It looked pretty neat on imaging, scare some people. Um, <clears throat> and so for the dual kidneys, those are typically from people with lower lower clearances, uh, it might be like um, an older kid, like a, an adolescent or somebody in their young, their 20s or so that has some sort of acute kidney injury when they come in. So the kidneys, their creatinine might be really high even if it was normal when they first came in, but now they're not functioning super well and so you don't wanna put those into somebody who has a really high clearance need. You wanna put them in to somebody who doesn't need that much. So there's a lot of different ways that countries are dealing with the organ shortage. Um, and one is an opt-out versus an opt-in strategy. And so Spain has long been known as the gold standard in organ donation. They have, uh, these numbers are from 2015, um, but they had 40.2 donors per million population, both Spain and Croatia did, compared to the US, which was about 28. 
Um, and so those numbers seem really small, and it's because there are, they are small. Um, we definitely need a lot more organ donors. Um, but the opt-out policy is where people are automatically designated as donors unless they go and sign themselves up on what's called a refusal registry. So you're saying specifically, I don't want to be a donor. You can also address that by adding it into an advanced will or directive or something like that. Um, and France actually just adopted an opt-out policy at the beginning of this year. So these are the countries with opt-out. Um, but unfortunately, it's not always the solution. It's not always the answer. Because Greece, which has an opt-out policy, has a really low donation rate at 7.1 um, per million population. So we're gonna talk about some of the milestones in transplant and donation. Before we even get to the first successful kidney transplant in the 1950s, back in the early 1900s, um, the first successful, successful experimental kidney transplant was performed in Vienna, Austria with animals. Um, and it wasn't until the 1930s that the first ever actual kidney, human to human kidney transplant was performed. Uh, but unknown to the doctors at the time, the donor and the recipient EBO were mismatched and so the kidney never functioned. In the 1940s, there were a lot of advancements in understanding of immunologic basis of organ rejection. And then in the early 1950s, cortisone-like meds were developed to suppress the immune, the immune system, and that resulted in the first successful kidney transplant in 1954. And that was done at Brigham Hospital in Boston between identical twins. And then in the 1960s, um, they had a lot more advancements in tissue typing and developed better techniques for uh, matching donor and recipient blood and tissue types. Uh, as well as improvements in the, present, in the preservation of deceased donor organs. There are also a lot of advance, advancements in immunosuppression that decreased the likelihood of rejection. Uh, and then cyclosporin, which is also a very common um, med that um, transplant recipients take, um, was developed and, and is still commonly used today. Oh, and then, um, and then in 1984, the National Organ Transplant Act was passed. Uh, and this outlawed the sale of human organs. So prior to this, there wasn't really any clear ju jurisdiction about what property the rights there were for a human cadaver. And so there aren't really any rules. People just kind of willy-nilly make up their own and go with it. Um, but so this was developed uh, and authorized by the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and the goal was to help maximize donation and regulate it a little bit better to make sure that it was being done equitably. It helped establish the formation of the OPTN, the Organ Procurement and Transplantation Network, and the Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients, and we'll talk about those a little bit more. And so more milestones in transplants. So in the 19, late 1980s, we saw the first successful intestine, split liver, and living liver donor transplants performed. Uh, in 1987, UNOS began collecting data on donors and recipients so that outcomes could be measured we can better study how to move forward. Um, and then in the early 1990s, they did the first living liver, or sorry, first living lung donor. Um, and then UNOS developed Donate Life America, which is one of the biggest donation advocacy groups, uh, nonprofit. Can I do a little Yeah. Thanks for sharing, I appreciate that. Go Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> and so these numbers are from May 8th, 2015. So they're a little out of date, but at that point we had hit 500,000 organ transplants performed. And as she mentioned, heart lung transplants, you can see that those are sort of bottom right there. Those are the least common type of transplant. So they do heart and lung as a block into the recipient. 
Uh, kidneys by far are the most commonly transplanted organ, and it just kind of goes down from there. Liver, heart, lung, kidney, pancreas, and solitary pancreas, intestine, and heart and lung. And so in 2016, we hit a record of more than 33,000 organs being transplanted in the U.S., and that was a 20% growth over the last five years. But clearly, that's still not enough, right? We still have this really big organ shortage that continues to grow, and so we need to figure out how to address it. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the regulatory bodies of organ donation because that's really important. Uh, so the OPTN, it's a public-private partnership that links all of the professionals in the U.S. that are involved in transplant. So that includes the HLA labs, that includes the transplant centers, the, um, the OPOs, et cetera. Um, and they were also, uh, they were established um, out of NODA. Um, so the goals of the OPTN, as you can see, to increase the effectiveness and efficiency of organ sharing and to um, help with equity to make sure that the system is equal and fair for everybody. And then UNOS, the United Network for Organ Sharing. Um, UNOS administers the, the contract under the Health and Human Resources, the Health Resources and Services Administration of the U.S. Health and Human Services. Tongue twister. And then CMS is really important to us too because CMS provides reimbursement to hospitals. Um, and as a, com as a condition of reimbursement, hospitals have to to uh, report imminent deaths to their designated OPO. So for Stanford, your designated OPO is Donor Network West. So if you have a patient that needs to be referred, it will come into us. Um, and CMS covers the cost of dialysis as a treatment for end-stage renal disease, which is only one of two available treatments for ESRD. Um, and so ESRD, if you're not aware, it's a long-standing chronic kidney disease that ultimately leads to renal failure. The only other alternative treatment to dialysis is transplant. Um, some fun facts about ESRD. More than 650 patients a year in the U.S. are affected by it, and that's more than two, about 2 million people worldwide. And in the U.S., that number is growing by about 5% each year. Worldwide, it's about 5 to 7%, so a lot of people are affected by it. Um, unfortunately, it disproportionately affects minority and low-income patients, and compared to Caucasians, African Americans are at a three and a half higher times uh, risk to have end-stage renal disease. Native Americans and Hispanics are at a one and a half times greater risk of having ESRD. Um, and so patients with end-stage renal disease only make up about 1% of the Medicare population, but account for 7% of the overall budget. So it's very resource in intensive. Um, and the average annual cost for hemodialysis is about $89,000 a year. Uh, and the average cost for a kidney transplant is $32,000 for the first year and then about $25,000 a year afterwards. So even though it's still a lot of money, it's a significant savings. So CMS is invested in helping people get kidney transplants. And so there are 58 OPOs or organ procurement um, organizations across the U.S. Um, you can kind of see, I know the quality is not that great, but there's four in California. Uh, but not all of the OPOs are bound by state boundaries. Uh, but each one has a designated service area, um, or a DSA, and each OPO is part of the larger region. So for us in California, we're part of Region 5. That also includes Nevada, Utah, New Mexico, and Arizona. And this is really important uh, when it comes to allocation, so keep the regions in mind. Um, and OPOs are, OPOs are basically the facilitators of donation. We work with the donor hospitals and the transplant centers to do the donor workup and allocate the organs, and, um, and we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Um, just sort of an interesting fact. By geographic area, WALC, which is the blue number 21, uh, they are the largest by geographic area, but only the 11th largest by population. Uh, and in terms of population density, PADV, Pennsylvania on the East Coast uh, is the largest by population, but the 35th biggest geographically. So there's a lot of disparity in how many people are necessarily waiting in each, each OPO. And so for us, uh, there are four uh, OPOs in California, and we happen to be the largest donor network west. Um, there's also Sierra Donor Services, which covers this funny little pocket that gray area in the middle of California, and they also have two hospitals in Santa Rosa. There's also one legacy that covers the Los Angeles area, and then life-sharing San Diego, which covers San Diego. 
And so for us, our DSA includes from the California Oregon border down to San Luis Obispo, uh, and Sierra Donor Services covers that little pocket right there uh, and the two hospitals in Santa Rosa. So I think we've also heard this growing up in math class, a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle isn't necessarily a square. So any hospital, so let me make sure I have this right. A transplant center can be a donor hospital, but not all donor hospitals can be transplant centers. So Stanford is a transplant center, but it's also considered a donor hospital. And a donor hospital is any hospital where there's a donor, easy enough. Um, but transplant centers obviously require special accreditation and programs to make sure that they are uh, equipped to handle transplants. Um, and not all transplant centers have all organ programs. And so, for us, we have um, five transplant centers in our local area. So there's Stanford and Packard. There's CPMC, Cal Pacific Medical Center in the city, which is just an adult program. Uh, and then there's also UCSF, and then their Pediatric Center Mission Bay, which opened up in February of 2015. And so sort of just to give you an idea of the variability of programs in the Sierra Donor Services area, the Sacramento area, they just have a heart transplant program and a kidney pink transplant program, whereas um, UCSF and Stanford have all organ transplant programs. So just because you need a transplant doesn't mean that you can go to any transplant center. Um, so Sierra Donor Services in the Sacramento area only has two transplant centers. The San Diego OPO only covers four transplant centers. We have five. Uh, and then Sierra, or, um, One Legacy in the Los Angeles area has 13 transplant centers. So there's no correlation with how many transplant centers are in a particular DSA. And so we look at transplant and donors in a couple of different ways. There's the local side where we have patients in our DSA. And then in general, uh, we allocate the organs to our local patients first and then we move out further and further. And then on the other side of that, there's imports, where we're importing organs for people at our transplant centers from outside OPOs. And imports are really high volume and low yield. We get well over 10,000 offers uh, every year from outside OPOs offering organs to patients listed at our transplant centers. So you can see in 2015, we had almost 11,000 offers, which was a huge increase from the year before. Uh, and of those, we only offered about half of them to our transplant centers, but we only imported 4.2% of organs. And so no matter how many thousands of offers we see, the number of imports that we, the number of organs that we actually import stays relatively steady at about 4 to 5% every year. And in 27 year to date, uh, this was a, a couple of weeks ago, um, we had gotten almost 7,000 offers and we had offered about 3,000 of those to our transplant centers and we had brought in um, five five percent of organs year to date. Um, and we are on track to get over 11,000 offers again uh, and import a lot of organs for our patients. Um, yeah. Can yeah, absolutely. Um, so what controls how many offers, um, how many offers you offer to transplant? And when you say imported, is it from other than the United States, from all in the United States, or mm -hmm. is that not yours. Yeah, so an import would be any organ coming from outside of our designated service area, so California, Oregon, down to San Luis Obispo. Uh, yeah, this is just for imports. Um, locally, we have about 300 organ donors a year. Um, Pennsylvania, that OPO with the really high population density, they did 540 donors uh, in 2016. Um, and the, the OPO in the Los Angeles area did 482. Last year we had kind of a low year uh, and we did 291 donors. And so the number of donors also varies greatly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, oh, there, there's not really a one-size-fits-all answer. There's a lot of different things that go into it. Um, sometimes it's just it's a matter of distance. Um, and we'll, we'll get into sort of the, the amount of time organs can be out of the body, and that definitely fix, affects viability. Um, the kidneys are pretty hardy, and we'll talk about it more later, but they can be out of the body for 24 to 48 hours. And so kidneys are most frequently the organ that we're importing, and so you'll see those flown 
all across the U.S. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and all the lists are prioritized a little bit differently. Typically, it goes from the local patients and then out further and further, but there are different, different things that go into the algorithms for each list. And so sometimes, um, depending on how good of a tissue typing match it is for a kidney donor and recipient, somebody from Maine might pop up to the top of our list, and those are considered mandatory shares, not to get too much into the details, but... Um, those things, because they're more ideal matches between the donor and the recipient, UNOS wants to prioritize those, and so those patients get sort of a first shot at getting that offer before it goes to their local patients, and so. And so I know this is a really busy slide, and we're gonna go through the process together, um, but a lot of this happens sort of simultaneously after the pre-donation phase. So, the first thing that happens is you have this initial event, whether it's a car accident or um, a shooting or somebody has a stroke, um, there's always a separation between the hospital team and the transplant team. And so every effort, again, is made to save the, the life of the patient at the hospital. There's no mention of donation at this point. These were our numbers from 2016. Um, and you can see the types of uh, the donors that we have by cause of death. And so most frequently we see anoxic injuries, we see strokes, and we see head trauma. And this kind of breaks down a little bit more what types of injuries we see. And so for anoxia, you see a lot of heart attacks, asphyxiation, like from hangings, um, and drug intoxication or overdose. Those are the most common things that we see for anoxic events. Less commonly, we have seizures and drownings. Um, something that I found kind of interesting when I started with the OPO uh, is that donation is very seasonal and the types of death that we see are very seasonal. And so in the summer, you get more pediatric drownings, things like that, because people are out in the warm weather enjoying swimming. And, and so um, we see more of those types of deaths. Um, when winter starts, you see a lot more car accidents, things like that. Or when it starts raining for the first time, you can kind of see these trends. Um, for head trauma, motor vehicle or motorcycle accidents are definitely the most common thing that we see. Um, but we also see a lot of gunshot wounds, just kind of depending on the area. Um, a lot of older people have falls or people that are intoxicated get too drunk, fall over, hit their head. That's something that we see. Um, and also assault is, is uh, something that can contribute to head trauma as well. Um, and for strokes, uh, we see a lot of hemorrhagic and ischemic strokes. And so once a patient is deemed to have a non-survivable injury, at that point, this is when the donor hospital, because of the CMS requirement, will call the OPO and just report this as a potential donor. Um, it's really important that these things get called into us early so that we can do an initial evaluation before donation is even mentioned to the family. None of that has happened yet. We're just going to make an initial assessment as to whether donation is even something we can offer. If it's somebody who was in a car crash but had metastatic cancer, they can't be a donor and we don't want them to go to the family and offer that as an option when truly that's not possible. And so these are the referral, referral cues that we have for Donor Network West. And so I think you can see it. Uh, it says, for ventilated patients with a non-recoverable illness or injury, and that's the really important part, non-recoverable, uh, please call for any of these. At the first indication that the patient has suffered a non-recoverable illness or injury, prior to plans for family discussions regarding comfort care or withdrawal of life-sustaining measures, and prior to plan for formal brain death evaluation. Um, and so it's really important that hospitals call this into us early so that we can go on site, do our assessment, um, and then also sometimes by the time that uh, doctors have disclosed to families that this is a non-survivable injury, the family may move very quickly through their grief process and already be done and wanting to withdraw care by the time that we even go and make that initial assessment. So then we're the bad guys on site trying to get this family to extend their time frame to draw out the grieving process and to just consider donations. So that's really not ideal. And then for tissue donors, um, we, we want hospitals to call them in as soon as possible, but within one hour 
uh, of asystole. Yeah, no, no. Let's say, you know, the doctor knows that that's it, right? Mm -hmm. Um, it just, it, it kind of depends on each patient's course and, and sort of. No, but it also depends on you guys, right? Because you need to get to this guy, see if it's brain, uh, brain dead, you know, and then the doctor will go and talk, if I understand correctly. And then the doctor goes and talks to the family. Yeah, so, so the patients get referred to us, and then we have somebody off-site. We can do a lot of these um, evaluations off-site, and we get a lot of information from the bedside nurse. We do a lot of phone conversation with the, the hospital staff on-site. Um, getting just sort of basic information about how close they are to brain death, sort of what the plan is, so that we can make sure that we have staff allocated appropriately. Um, and once it looks like, you know, the family is, assuming the family is there on site, and it looks like they're maybe moving in that direction, then we want to have somebody out there sort of ready to go before, before they even approach the family um, as they would do in their normal process. So we want donation to be sort of a non-invasive thing until the, the point of the family saying that they're interested or if somebody has signed themselves up to be a donor. We don't want to be intrusive. We just want to be ready to present that option to families. And so we work in collaboration with the donor hospital, uh, with the physicians, to do that approach and to talk about donation because, you know, everybody, everybody has their own thoughts about donation, but our organization and the OPO staff, they're all trained in a specific way, and they have all of the information that that families need, and so we want to make sure it's being presented in, in the right way. And so we do that in collaboration with the, the hospital staff. Does that answer your question? What is the length of, is there a possibility there is a patient, everybody knows he's dead except for the family, and how long does that take? And then um, could the conversation of this patient might be um, dead happen, and then you come in, or you come in, and then the physician talks to them? So usually, I and the separation, which, and, and I completely admire your job, right? It's just I'm trying to understand. No, absolutely. Happens. Um, and so, you know, ideally we always want to have somebody physically on site to have these conversations in person, but sometimes because of high staffing or high activity, low staffing and high activity, we do phone approaches as well. But so the, the attending physician is going to do their normal process of, you know, deciding uh, that this is a non-survivable injury, they're not going to move forward with any other interventions. Um, and then when they go to give the family grave prognosis, you know, it, and it takes a, it's, it's a very nuanced thing because you have social workers from the donor, ho donor hospital that we're communicating with because we want to get a sense of this family's openness to donation. Um, one of the other things that we do is we look at the patient when we get the initial referral on uh, registries across the U.S. to see if that patient is registered as a donor, uh, which we refer to as FPA or first person authorization. Because if the patient becomes brain dead, that is a legally binding document, and that person has made their wishes known that they want to be a donor. And so it's a little bit of a different conversation at that point. Um, but we try to offer donation as, as a possibility um, at the time that they're making grave prognosis or maybe shortly thereafter, once the family has some time to kind of let that news sink in and kind of decide how they want to move forward. Um, so, so again, we want to make sure that we're ready there and we're having the conversations, but that we're not preemptively doing that. We want the hospital to do their normal process first, make sure that they're, they've independently decided that there's no, there's no hope for survival um, or for meaningful recovery and that, and that we're just kind of waiting in the wings should donation feel like an appropriate conversation. It, I mean, and it could be a couple hours. Sometimes we have families that are very clearly struggling and, you know, want, are hoping for a miracle. We see that a lot with families, that they're hoping for a miracle. They want to give it a couple days. And so we just do, like, a daily phone call to the, to the bedside nurse to just let them know, like, hey, if anything changes, let us know. But we don't go on site. We don't want to be intrusive. Um, well, so every, every hospital has a different policy. In California, one, uh, two brain death notes are required. Um, for pediatrics, they have that at least a 24-hour separation. 
um, in between brain death nodes. But other states only require one brain death node, like Nevada, for example, only requires one brain death node. Um, for adults, for the most part, um, there isn't um, there isn't a time frame, a necessary time frame, unless stipulated by the hospital's policy uh, that they need to wait in between brain death exams, but it does need to be done between, by two different people. And that's actually our next slide, <laughs> declaration of death and disclosure. So in California, you have to have two physicians declaring death, <coughs> brain death, um, that are independent of the donation process, and they've determined that the patient is brain dead, um, and then at that point, a donation discussion is initiated with the family. If the person has registered themselves to be a donor, then we disclose that first person authorization status to the family. And so these are the guidelines set out by the American Academy of Neurology. And so first and foremost, sort of a prerequisite for even doing brain death exams, you need to make sure that the, there's nothing that's gonna confound and give the appearance of brain death, one that's not actually true. So you wanna make sure that the patient is normothermic. There aren't any drugs on board or there's no severe acid base electrolyte or endocrine abnormalities. You wanna make sure that this person, if they appear brain dead, are actually brain dead. So they always do a, both a clinical exam and you're looking for the absence of brainstem reflexes and those are the reflexes that they're checking. And then they also do uh, an apnea exam. And so they'll pre-oxygenate a patient, they'll deliver 100% FiO2 for 10 minutes and then they'll turn off the ventilator and see if the patient is um, initiating any breaths. So we're looking for the absence of a respiratory drive. So each brain death declaration has to include those two components. That's really important. Yeah, sorry, question? Oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead. So you were talking about um, declarations being a donor and then having possible family as well. Mm -hmm. So if someone is, has declared a donor and then becomes brain dead, is that, is that binding or does the family say, no, I really don't want them to be a donor? Just in case that, that so, I mean, if, if a person has uh, signed up on the registry, then that is a legally binding document. And so we make every effort to move forward with donation with those patients if, if it's possible. Um, we have had cases of patients that were first person authorizations for the family was very strongly opposed to it, which in this particular case was interesting because a family member was also a kidney recipient, which we kind of struggled emotionally with. But, you know, we ultimately, you know, not all publicity is good publicity for donation. And so we're very cognizant of that. Um, and we try to balance sort of the, the needs of the family versus the, the need to, to increase organ donation. Um, so it's, it's definitely a fine balance that we walk. Um, but for patients that have not signed themselves up on a registry, we do approach the family and then it's their decision as to whether or not they want their, their loved one to be a donor. Is there another question? Yeah, so our staff has the ability to look up different registries. Um, if we find out that somebody was visiting California from out of the area, we contact their local OPO and they, are, they can look up the registry in that state to see if the patient has listed themselves. There's, there's definitely a hierarchy, uh, and I, I don't have that memorized what the order is, but there's, there's definitely a hierarchy for how we, um, who's, who's, ably, who's able to be the, the legal next of kin. Um, and then there's also, um, if the legal next of kin is, um, doesn't feel like they can make the decision, they can sign a waiver to authorize somebody else in the family or another person to, to make those decisions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or if you, you have somebody who's reporting that this is their spouse, but they're not legally married, they may not be the legal next of kin. And so we definitely make every effort to make sure that we are on the right side of the law and we are talking to the legally appropriate people. Um, we do sometimes have family members that are, you know, have conflicting views about donation. And one person says they would really want to be a donor because they were a really giving person. Um, and then other family members that just may be vehemently opposed to it. And in those cases, we try to have the family kind of come to a decision on their own so that we're not the ones coming in and enforcing a decision.
Yeah, and that was that was another point that I was going to bring up is that a lot of times the people the reason why families get upset about these first person authorizations is that they feel a lack of control in the decision making process, and so that's why it is really important to not only register yourself as a donor but tell everybody that this is what you want, this is what you believe in, and then that way everybody else feels comfortable that they knew this was your decision going in and that this power isn't being taken away from them um, at a verily emotionally charged time. So then after we have authorization or the person has signed themselves up as a donor and we've made that disclosure to the family and we're moving forward, um, we begin the donor uh, management and allocation process. Um, and so there are a lot of different requirements by Oregon that UNOS requires in order for us to make offers. So if we're gonna be offering out somebody's heart, you need all the requisite information. You need an echo, you need an EKG, you need to have all these pieces of information for each organ. And these are the things that we gather during the donor management process. Um, and so we are also optimizing organ function as well. And so we're weaning pressors before doing an echo. We're recruiting the lungs to try and increase oxygenation. If somebody's got an elevated sodium, we're maybe adjusting their maintenance IV fluids and giving free water flushes, things like that. We're trying to make these organs look really good and function to the best of their ability before we start offering them out to transplant centers. Yeah. So, oh, go ahead. But then where, if it's a totally different system than transplant centers in terms of a hierarchy, the way that the, the link is spread, because they're not just flown back to their daily records. No. <laughs> No, so wherever, wherever the, the accident happens, that's most likely where the donor is gonna stay. Um, so the donor hospital would refer the patient to their local OPO, wherever that is, and then that OPO would probably contact us to look up the patient on their registry. Yeah, so then that would be that OPO's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the patient would be that OPO's patient, not a, a patient that we are managing. Um, good question. Um, and so once we have all of those pieces of information, uh, we run lists and for every organ that we are going to be allocating. Um, and so for the most part, each individual organ has its own individual list. There are two that are clumped together and that's the heart-lung list because we do try to allocate heart-lung blocks when able. Um, and then there's also uh, KP or kidney pancreas recipients. Um, they also use the term simultaneous kidney pancreas, or simultaneous pancreas kidney, so SPK. There's a lot of different terms for that. Um, but each individual list has its own algorithm for how it's ranked, um, and this kind of goes into that a little bit more. Um, for the most part, um, and it's hard to make sort of sweeping generalizations about donation and allocation and everything. Sort of a joke in our department is case by case basis. That's our motto because every case is a little bit different. Every donor is a little bit different. The organs that we're offering, the way the list looks, it's always a little bit different. But for the most part, for all organs except for kidney, lists are ranked based on medical urgency and distance. And so for the most part, we're allocating to the sickest patients in our local area and then further and further out. And so if there isn't anybody that's super sick in our local area, it would go to the region. So for us, that's California, Nevada, Utah, New Mexico, and Arizona, the regionally sickest patient. And then it would come back to our local center for the next sickest patients and then go back out to the region and then out to the nation. So we're trying to prioritize the patients in our area that need the organs the most. Kidneys are the exception in that they're ranked primarily based on waiting time. Um, but as I, I kind of mentioned to you earlier, they're, um, if it's an ideal tissue typing match between the donor and the recipient, um, then that would give that patient priority. Um, something new that's been introduced into kidney allocation is, um, is uh, patients that are highly sensitized. So if you're somebody who's developed a lot of antibodies because you've had a bunch of blood transfusions or something like that, or you've had a previous organ transplant, your body has developed a lot of antibodies and the, likely of you, the likelihood of you being able to get a transplant and find a match is really, really low. And so when you have this ideal tissue typing match between donor and recipient, we wanna make sure that those patients are getting prioritized and bumped up to the top of the list, no matter where they are in the country. 
and s- you go in to an algorithm, you get John, Nancy, whatever, and then the first one you just master, like, okay, you know the list, you know they're the highest, they're the local. Mm-hmm. Um, so then, so then we go through the offering process, um, and so as you kind of saw with the import stuff, not all organs get offered verbally offered to to um, each recipient. Um, so a lot of our centers have developed what we call import criteria, and so Stanford, let's say, they have kidney criteria that says they don't want any offers from donors over 60. So if I get an offer from no matter where it is in the country, and the donor's 79, I already know that Stanford is not going to want this kidney, so I'm not going to call the surgeon. I'm not going to wake him up in the middle of the night about it. If it's anything that falls outside of that rule-out criteria, then it's an offer that we would make. And so a lot of these things we are offering out to um, other organizations that are that have, they have their own uh, import criteria or rule-out criteria, and so they're determining on their end is this a rule out for their transplant center or do they make the offer to the surgeon? And so it does just kind of go one by one. Um, size matching is also particularly important um, for, for peds, um, but mostly for thoracic organs. And so you don't, you know, your rib cage kind of limits the amount of space that you have in your chest. And so it's really important to make sure that the, the donor and the recipient are appropriately matched size wise. Um, for abdominal organs, it does matter for the liver, um, but it's, it's a little less picky, but you can't have somebody who's six foot three transplanted into somebody my size. And so for the organ recovery and transplant, once all the organs have been allocated for transplant or research is authorized, if the family is authorized for research and the coroner is okay with that, uh, then we set an OR time and we coordinate with all the teams to get the donor to the OR for the organ recovery. Um, and then once the organs have been recovered, they get taken back to their transplant centers and implanted into the recipients. And so if, um, it's really important that the teams all work together collaboratively. Abdominal teams, for the most part, are okay with another center recovering for them. So let's say Stanford has accepted kidneys from a donor, but UCSF is getting the liver. There's sort of a hierarchy for who's responsible for doing the recovery. So Stanford is not going to send a team because UCSF can recover all of the abdominal organs for them. So that's kind of nice for them. It's less resource intensive. Um, thoracic teams are, are different in that they all like to send their own team for their own organs. And so if Stanford and UCSF were accepting heart and lungs on a donor, they would both send a team to do the donor. They don't want to have somebody else recover their organs. And so when we're coordinating OR times, you see something like this. she lives and everything's happy. <laughs> but so you have that happening every single day for all these different teams all across the US. And so we just had a donor the other day where I think there were four different teams in the OR, one for heart, one for lungs. Um, surgeons have to be accredited to recover the particular organ that they're going to recover. And so Stanford has their fellows do the recovery. Not all of the fellows are signed off on all the abdominal organs. So depending on what's being recovered, you may have to have two different abdominal teams coming. So sometimes you can have really heavily populated ORs and everybody's squishing in there. But you're having teams come from all across the US potentially um, to come to your donor OR to do the recovery. And so there's a lot of logistics involved. It takes hours and hours to get these things into place. Typically, when we send a team somewhere, we need at least a five hour heads up. It takes at least a couple hours to get a plane into place. Um, and so even in our local area, because of the geographic area that we cover, um, we will fly teams to donor hospitals. So um, if Stanford is accepting lungs from one of our donors in Fresno, we have a really big hospital there, they fly. They don't drive because it's too much cold time for the organs. Um, sorry, yeah? Stanford flies out of Moffett Airfield, the Air Force Base. 
um, but uh, San Francisco flies out of SFO. So we all, they all use um, FBOs or fixed space operations. So they're just small private airports. So that's where the rich and famous fly out of for the most part, right? But it's a lot easier to get in and out of those because they're lower traffic. They prioritize these medical flights and everything. So you're not waiting to deboard a plane um, with your organ in hand. Pardon? Um, so the, and I don't have a super great understanding of all the financial stuff, but the, uh, my understanding is that the, the cost is divided by all of the, the transplants that they do that year. And so just because your organ came from North Dakota and that was a more expensive flight doesn't mean that you're going to get charged more for it because somebody else got a heart from just down the street. So it gets split up equally. Yeah. Pardon? So they, they mm -hmm. So let's say they have four organs and we're just coming in. Mm -hmm. um, it's it all happens at once, right? Mm -hmm. They're not like, oh, and is there like a, um, all right, lungs go first, kidney goes last, is there like a, or they're just all working in one minute? So yeah, every, everybody is definitely working at the same time. It's not like the heart team comes in and does their thing and then the next team comes in. Everybody's working and doing their dissection at the same time. Um, when it comes to the order of organs coming out, it just kind of depends on how fast you are as a surgeon. And so a lot of times it is heart and then lungs and then the rest of the abdominal organs, so liver, pancreas, and then kidneys last. Yeah? If it's too big to fly over, it will not be charged to the patient or their family? It's, it's part of the cost for the transplant fee. But um, like I was saying, if your organ came from further away than somebody else's, you're not necessarily getting charged more because you're not getting penalized because your organ came from further away. That cost. Pardon? No, the, the, res the donor family is not financially responsible. They're not paying for Stanford's flight to Las Vegas. No. <laughs> no. The, donor's fam the donor family is not financially responsible. So yeah, so the, fam the donor family is not responsible for anything associated with the donation process. And so as soon as somebody is declared brain dead, the OPO assumes financial responsibility and billing. So for any procedures, anything that happens after the patient has been declared brain dead, then that's not on the donor family to pay for. Um, and so I think I answered your question about timing. Um, so for, yeah, for the most part, uh, the thoracic organs come out first and then the abdominal organs come out um, afterwards because the thoracic organs are a lot more sensitive to cold ischemic time or time uh, outside uh, of the body. Yeah. So when do they decide, like, okay, this is it. The, the, we're not ventilating anymore. We're not, uh, we're not doing this anymore. Yeah, so they, so. Yeah, so anesthesia, um, they're there until we cross clamp. And so the surgeons go in and they're doing all of their dissection. They're making sure that they have all of their 
um, their catheters in place and everything for the flushing and the preservation um, and their cannulas in place. Um, and then um, once everybody is ready to move forward with cross clamp, and that's the point at which you start flushing out all of the blood and you start flushing through the preservation solution to start cooling down the organs, um, everybody needs to be ready at the same time for that to happen. And so after that, uh, if the donor is not a lung donor, anesthesia is done. They don't need to be there anymore. Um, but if it is a lung donor, they, they remain on the ventilator, they just turn it off. And then afterwards, they need the lungs inflated during transport back to the transplant center. And so they need to stay until the lungs are ready to come out so they can reinflate them. While you're cocooning, but after you're, you're done, like once the organs are in the cooler, mm -hmm. they're inflated? No, no, they're, they're, uh, when, when they're packaged and everything, they're inflated. Because one of the things that we do during donor management is we're trying to maximize um, oxygenation. And so what we do, what are called recruitment maneuvers. And so you're trying to recruit more of the alveoli for a maximum gas exchange. And so if you transport the lungs and they're in, you know, they're on ice, all deflated, then the, the alveoli are all collapsing. And so then it's a lot harder once you transplant them to get them to open up again. And it's a lot harder. Is that a machine or something that's continuously? There, so, so we'll, we'll talk about different kinds of preservation methods, um, but for the most part, the organs, the trachea gets clamped, the lungs stay inflated during transport, and then they're just in a, in a preservation solution while they get transported back. Yeah, the lungs don't deflate, they deflate the trachea. Yeah. So they don't stay inflated, they can't, the air can't get past them. Yeah. Uh, so 27, year to date, uh, we've flown teams 164 times to outside donor service areas. Uh, from as close to Sacramento and as far as Dayton, Ohio. So we do a lot of flyouts. We send teams a lot of different places. Um, but we like to work collaboratively with a lot of centers with our abdominal programs. And so if there's another abdominal surgeon out in Ohio that can do this recovery for us, that's one less plain leg that we're paying for potentially. So instead of flying a team out there to do the recovery and then flying back, potentially we're just flying the organ from wherever it is back to our transplant center. Um, and so there are a lot of timing considerations that go into setting an OR. Um, and so sometimes the transplant center has a really heavy workload and they don't have personnel to send on a recovery for a particular OR time. Uh, maybe the recipient lives really far away from the transplant center and it's gonna take them hours to get there. They need to be admitted and everything before, um, before they're able to be transplanted. Um, and it's always important to get eyes on the recipient first because sometimes you have patients show up and they say that they're fine, but they come in and they've got the flu. And so it's not until then that they can really make a determination that this patient is ready. And that has happened. Um, so uh, how long are organs viable for? And so heart and lungs are definitely the most sensitive. And so that's why the thoracic teams fly everywhere because they need to get right back to the transplant center. Um, I think the farthest away that we've accepted a heart was from North Dakota this year. We just did a fly out there. Um, but it's really important that the heart team is able to leave right away. And so they get their organ and they go. They don't wait for the rest of the organs to come out. Lungs also very sensitive, and so it's the same sort of situation. Um, but the abdominal organs can withstand a little bit more cold time. And so that starts from cross clamp when you start flushing out all the blood and flushing in the preservation solution to the time that the organ gets transplanted to the anastomosis in the recipient. That's when cold time ends. Um, kidneys by far are the most hardiest and can withstand the most cold time. Um, and there's different, there's different methods that are being studied and trialed to extend the, the life of the organ, so to speak, outside of the body before transplant. And so these are some of the alternative methods of preservation. Um, so this is heart in a box. So sorry, it's a really short clip. But you can see the heart is on this machine. It's being um, perfused with blood. So it's normothermic preservation. Um, normally what we do is we store the organs in cold solution and on ice. Um, and so lung in a box is also a similar thing. Can I take a picture before we wrap it up? Five people. All five. 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 You can kind of see the lungs. <laughs> you can see them inflating and deflating yeah. a little bit. And the idea with these, with these normothermic preservation techniques are that you can kind of fine tune the organ as you go. And so when, typically when you take the organ out and you put it into, um, in your cooler with ice, you can't do anything to it in the meantime. It's just there until you get back to the transplant center. Uh, when you have these perfusion devices, you can kind of tweak the organs as you go. You can administer meds, you can make 
adjustments uh, to them as needed prior to transplant and kind of fine tune them a little bit more. Um, this is one of the newest programs. It's called Organox, and it's for normothermic liver perfusion. So you can kind of see it's just this big giant machine. And then this is what the liver looks like sitting in that basin. And so again, the transplant centers bring blood with them to help perfuse the organ, and so they're not just taking a bunch of blood from the donor. Um, organ ox, no, for the liver, no. Uh, I believe Stanford does the heart and the lung in a box, so uh, it's nuts. Yeah, so that's so it's there. There are a lot of considerations that go into using these devices for the teams um, because they're they're huge and so they're really cumbersome to travel with and so that's definitely taken into consideration and so they might do these more with donors that are, are local and just to drive away rather than having to get this on a plane because really you can't get it on a plane it's too big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so standard standard is to put the organ in its preservation solution. You bag it up, you put it in a in a box with a bunch of ice or a cooler, and it stays like that. And that's the way that so you transport it. Yeah, so it's you're either doing the cold static. Uh, preservation or or you're doing one of these alternative methods of preservation and a lot of these are trials and so we're, we're not seeing them super commonly there's still a lot of things that go into whether or not they can they can do this for each patient um, well so I mean that's that's what they're trying to figure out they're trying to figure out if that helps extend the life of the organ um, if they're able to you know if they're able to fine-tune things a little bit more before they transplant the organ into the recipient and that's beneficial then then We'll definitely move in that direction, but it's it's still definitely under study. Um, and the the organox for the liver, we just did the first case, I think, on the west coast um, last month, late last month, was the first time that that had happened so far. So these things are definitely few and far in between. The common thing that we see is the cold static perfusion or uh, preservation with just the organ on ice. Yeah, sorry, it's it's just because it's a short clip, but it's on there and it's beating normally. Um, so it, we can do the same thing with kidneys too, and it's by providing what's called pulsatile perfusion. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't have a video. This is one type of kidney pump, but the heart and the, the lungs all kind of function similarly. Um, and so the, the goal with, for the kidney preservation, um, and this is cold preservation, they're trying to mimic the pulsatile perfusion. And so it's not just sitting there on ice, not doing anything. It's still perfusing, it's still functioning as a kidney would function. Um, and you're able, you can't see the numbers on there, but you're able to measure the, the function of the kidneys while they're on the pump. Um, you can also do this for kidneys that are, uh, if somebody's had like an acute kidney injury, they come in and their creatinine's normal, but then it starts skyrocketing right away, and then it's really high by the time you do the recovery. You can put those kidneys on, um, on a pump, and then that kind of helps them get back to, to, to their normal baseline function before you transplant them. Um, and that can definitely extend the life of a, of a kidney outside of the body. Are there any more questions about the donor side of stuff? Yeah. I'm sorry. No, I've not at all. Never seen a heart out of its yeah. normal place. It does it on its own, or you are like. It's it's the mechanism of the machine. Okay. I, and, and I have a really neat video of it on my phone, but it's, a, it's of a heart that's been taken out and it's on the back table, but you can still see it like pulsing because of the electrical conduction and, and it's still slowing down, but it's still beating essentially. Yeah, they, they want it to stay as, as a functioning yeah. heart essentially.
It's, it's, it's very science fiction-esque. It's really neat. Um, and uh, there was a great TED talk. Um, I think it was a Canadian physician. I can't remember his name. But he talked about the whole lung in a box trial um, and, and his center's experience with it. And so if you Google lung in a box TED talk, you'll find it pretty easily. Um, and so for the recipient side, these slides are going to be fairly high-level overview. Um, but in order to be evaluated for transplant, you have to get a referral from your GP. You can't just show up at a transplant center and make an appointment and say you feel like you need a kidney transplant. And you'd be surprised at how many people kind of do that. They've just kind of, they've web would themselves. They've decided that they have this condition and they go and call a transplant center and say, hey, I need to be evaluated, but it doesn't work like that. Um, if you are actually being referred by your GP uh, at the transplant center, you get evaluated by a multidisciplinary team. So there's a lot of people involved in deciding whether or not you are a good candidate for transplant. You need medical clearance, you need financial and insurance clearance, and then there's also um, clearance by the social work and, and psych teams. Uh, because the important thing is to make sure that if you are going to receive this gift, of which there is a very huge shortage, you are going to be able to care for this gift, and it's not going to be squandered. So if you're getting a liver transplant and you were previously an alcoholic, you have to prove that you've not been an alcoholic for X number of days, time, whatever the time commitment is. Um, because if you're just going to go back to drinking afterwards, then that could have gone into somebody else who needed it more, perhaps, and could have cared for it better. Um, and so once you've been accepted as a... Yeah, because you don't just get your transplant and go home, and then it's all it's all good to go. There's it's a very involved process. Oof. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's really important that everybody is on the same page about this person being a good steward of the gift is, is how we refer to it. Um, and so when you have been accepted as a candidate for transplant, you get added, you get registered uh, with UNOS and you are placed into the, the database. And when a list gets generated, then your name shows up on it. Depending on how sick you are, it might be closer to the top. Um, there are ways of getting transplants faster. So like we kind of mentioned with Steve Jobs and you've got the ability to fly to Tennessee where the list is super short and get transplanted faster. You can also get a living donor in certain situations. So for kidneys, a lot of people know somebody who's willing to donate an organ to them or um, I feel like I don't see it too much out in this area, but we've seen, we've had presentations from other speakers where they have all these pictures of people standing on the roadside with signs that say, my so-and-so needs a kidney or people that write these things on their cars. Like you see these things a lot. Um, people put on Facebook with, with social media, people are putting out there, if you know somebody who can donate a kidney to my person, and blood type O, you know, you see that a lot. Um, Sorry, no, no. Story. This was on local news um, at, at Duke, which is where I came from and I worked with a uh, husband wife team that he was a doll from the pediatric, they're both nurses, um, and he had, and he knew he would need a kidney on him, but he had college prep kidney disease. Um, and there was less than a 1% chance of child free kidney compatible, and his wife donated her kidney um, to him. They're like the size of they're footballs, like at least. Big. They're huge. The kidneys grow to be this big, and they're covered in sticks, right? College kids say. Um, if you want to shiver, Google that. I mean, they are, I mean, they, I don't know how much they weigh, but it's amazing that my friend and Jen could walk around with these kidneys in the body, and they were this big. Um, but he donated her kidney, and they're both doing great. But um, they were on the news because of the, the percentage oh, of chance that a child free compatible is so low. And Yeah. Yeah, and also if you have somebody who's willing to donate a kidney to you, but you and this person, your your uh, your donor is not an exact match, you can do what's called a, a kidney swap. So we did a kidney swap at CPMC, a six-way. So if you, so let's say you and I were a pair, and so I can't donate to you because we're blood type incompatible, but I can donate to you, and your partner can donate to her. And so you have these chains that go on, and this happens like all across the U.S., and these things are, they take years to coordinate. 
Um, so maybe it's not necessarily quicker, but it's more advantageous to get a living donor kidney than it is a deceased donor. But there are different ways of, of facilitating living donation, even if you and your direct donor are not a match. Uh, and so this is just kind of a look at the, all the personnel that are involved in, uh, in your work of enlisting. And so typically you get a transplant coordinator um, and they're gonna be your main contact with the, they're gonna be your contact throughout the process and they liaise with the rest of the transplant team, which includes uh, the surgeon who's actually going to do your surgery, um, as well as your specialist. So if you need a kidney transplant, nephrologist, heart transplant, cardiologist, et cetera. Um, and then also you have your financial coordinators, insurance case managers, and social workers to make sure that somebody has the appropriate support network in place. So you get a kidney transplant, you can't go right back to work and start earning income again the next day. You need to have somebody who can help take care of you while you get better. Um, and then dietitians are also really important because you can't just go back to eating whatever you were eating the day before after you get a transplant. Sometimes really significant uh, dietary changes are, are required. And then compatibility and cross-matching is a really big issue. It's really important that you have as close to an ideal match as possible between your donor and recipient, although you don't need to be an exact match. If that was the case, we'd be in really big trouble. Um, but so we do HLA typing, we get the tissue typing for the donor, for all donors, um, except for liver donors, liver only. So if you're, a liver, if you're only potentially going to be donating your liver, you don't need to do tissue typing. For any other organ that you're donating, you do. Um, and so a lot of times, centers are getting really good, their HLA labs are getting really good, and they're able to just look and do what's called a virtual cross-match. They look at the typing of the recipient and the typing of the donor and see if it's going to be compatible. They can calculate how likely it is to be compatible. Oh, yeah, if you have identical HLA to your twin. Um, uh, so they can do virtual cross-matching where they're just looking at the typing of the donor and the recipient. Um, but a lot of times they need to do um, a physical cross-match. They need to take the donor's serum and the recipient's serum and do a physical cross-match to see how many cells lice and how compatible this is going to be. Um, but regardless, all recipients are going to have to be on lifelong immunosuppression regimens. And so a lot of patients, um, they've been suffering from these chronic illnesses, these long-term illnesses that have led them to needing organ transplants. Um, and so initially after the surgery, they might feel really euphoric because these symptoms that they've been suffering from are no longer there. Um, but for a lot of patients, the post-operative courses can be more complex and it takes them a while to get back into the swing of things. Um, but the goal of transplant is to return to your normal routine of activities, hobbies, and work and everything. You're trying to achieve the same quality of life that you had before your illness. Um, and so OPOs, um, all, as far as I'm aware, all OPOs um, can help facilitate the recipient donor family connection. And so recipients, um, recipients a lot of times write, and they'll write letters uh, that go to us, and then we would pass those on to the donor family. Or if the donor family wants to communicate with the recipient, they send those letters to us, and then we reach out to the recipient to see if that's something that they're open to. Um, when I first started, I, th I thought, you know, why wouldn't they want to get in contact with one another? But there's a lot of feelings of guilt. There's a lot of, a lot of really complex emotions that people are feeling um, and may not necessarily want to hear from the donor family or to hear from the recipient because it's just too painful and it's reliving this trauma over and over again. Um, one of the things that our organization does is called the Donor Family Gathering. And so we give donor families the opportunity to make these um, quilt squares for their donor in remembrance of them. And then we have a gathering a couple times a year um, because our area is so big, we do them in different areas. And it gives donor families a chance to get together and meet one another and share their stories and meet our staff as well because they've interacted with us pretty, pretty closely throughout the donation process. <coughs> and then this was a really nice story. And finally, this is the touching moment Bill Connor met the man who has his daughter's heart. Bill's daughter, Abby, age 20, died suddenly in January. As an organ donor, she gave life to four others when she passed. In honor of Abby's memory, Bill set out to ride across the country. He put a call out to Abby's recipients to see if any were willing to meet him along the way. It's not about how many cars you have or homes you have or how much money. I mean, to give somebody life if you're in a tragedy like this, my daughter just set an example for me and I've got to follow it. 
2,000 kilometers later, Bill met Jack Jr. on Father's Day to hear his daughter's hard thinking. Well, it's working. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thanks very much for having me. Any other questions? Yeah. In developing an MIT open course web centric online university, uh, will the university continue to teach medical students in all 100 countries and online teaching offices? Uh, the possibility for helping people internationally in terms of uh, organ development or donor relations, especially with this uh, shortage of organs, is remarkable. You've focused a lot on the U.S., uh, but uh, with such a shortage and with the increased uh, potential for uh, prolongating organ life mm -hmm. and living with organ uh, duration, can you talk a tiny bit about the international issues in this regard? Um, I mean, the donation practices vary a lot uh, internationally. Um, we at CPMC, they get a lot of kidney recipients from Japan because Japan just, they have primarily living donation for kidneys over there because they don't believe in deceased donation for the most part. It's not, it's not a common practice. Um, and so you get a lot of recipients coming over from Japan being listed at CPMC for kidney. Um, and so, and kind of going back to OR timing, you have to make sure that this is a donor that can be on a ventilator long enough to get a recipient in from Japan and not somebody that's urgently going to the OR. Um, I think in terms of, of you know, having international recipients, it's, it's just not feasible to, to have an organ shipped overseas. I mean, we do ship kidneys all across the U.S. Uh, we ship livers a fair amount across the U.S., um, but it's even with the, the normothermic preservation devices, you know, we ship them on these devices or you're transporting them on these devices, and so that's you know, if, if Stanford owns this machine and they're gonna send a liver to Japan or wherever, you know, they need to make sure they get that machine back. It's very expensive. And so there's just a lot of, a lot of other sort of logistical considerations that I think would not really make that super feasible, unfortunately. I mean, a lot of countries that practice organ donation, there's shortages worldwide, and, and everybody's trying to transplant their own recipients. But like she was saying, there there are conferences. There are so many conferences throughout the year, and so it's really a collaborative effort between, you know, transplant centers worldwide. And so, with their you know, their goal is to share their practices and share what OPOs are sharing, what they're doing differently, to so to show how they're maximizing donation in their area, and and it's a lot of strategy sharing because um, we. Yeah, cultural issues definitely play into it as well. Um, but a lot of a lot of OPOs, you know, we, we talk about how how we deal with these things and, and what strategies have worked for us and approaches for families and, and kind of getting at the, the heart of it, which is altruism and um I also heard uh, was that DMV? Mm-hmm. I mean, so, so there's opt-in countries and there's opt-out. So for the U.S., right. we're an opt-in country. You have to designate yourself as a donor. We approach all families, of course, but you have to designate yourself a donor if you want to be 
a first person authorization, but a lot of countries have opt out where your default is, is to be a donor, like Spain, for example. Yeah, so there's a lot more potential donors, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's, there's more viability for organs, but that's definitely one way that that's being addressed. I mean, I, I think scalability is is not the biggest issue. It's just, it, you know, you would have to be staffed appropriately. Transplant centers all need need the staff, and if there are surgeons that are able, and, you know, if there there's the personnel to do it, then, you know, we, we don't want to be the barrier to not being able to make these things happen. Um, and, and in the, the big sort of timeline slide, um, I said that it takes anywhere from, like, 12 to 48 hours for the donation process, but sometimes we have families that are just done, they need, they want their person to be a donor, but they can't watch their person on a ventilator anymore. And so we'll go to the OR rapidly and do the recovery. This typically applies to kidneys only. And we put them on a pump, so we're, we keep them on this device that provides the pulsatile perfusion while we go through the normal testing that we would go through and then allocate afterwards. Um, but that's only being done with kidneys so far, just because they're the only ones that can stand being out of the body so long. Um, I mean, that's, that would be a great problem to have. I mean, it, that's the problem that we want to have. Yeah. Do you have a Um, I mean, for, for the most part, because it goes by local, regional, national, once the offer is getting out to us, it's because nobody else wants it to that point, and that's why it's gotten that far. Um, sometimes for kidneys, there, there is that exception because the person's highly sensitized or it's a perfect tissue typing match, but... Um, Sorry, not my area of expertise. No, <laughs> Mm -hmm. And Chris, who's the primary investigator here, and three of us work on that. And we talked to 
to uh, showing us Arizona, Gift of Life, Gift of Hope, Chicago, Life and Salvation, Meetings in Oregon, <coughs> Life of Life, Gift uh, and, and the NIH. So, yeah, it's enrolling 5,000 heart donor hearts mm -hmm. over five years, and we're two and a half years into it, and, um, and it is uh, looking at all these issues, clinical, so we're linked into the UNET, as well as um, the DMG, which is out of Portland, Oregon, the VA and uh, Oregon Health Sciences, and I believe uh, uh, Julie is the primary coordinator on that, and all that data will then uh, be coalesced and we're looking at practices, local practices. Dr. Cook pulled in OPAs throughout the country to look at different cultural events, mm -hmm. different um, different regions in the United States to know uh, have the custom sense recovery practices. Yeah, so something that I didn't really go over is when, when you have these lists, um, we're sending electronic offers to all these different transplant centers. And so they're clicking into this offer on DonorNet, they're reviewing their patient chart, and then they're just entering a code whether they're interested or not. And if they're not interested, it's like just these, these numeric codes that cover, that are really big, broad umbrellas for things. And so there's one for donor quality. That doesn't tell us specifically what it is about the donor, though. And so. You know, you're you're getting all these declines, but it's still not necessarily really clear unless there's there's a clear issue with the donor why people are turning down these organs. And then something really unfortunate that we see is when one center starts declining, another one starts declining. People always ask us when we make offers, well, what did everybody else ahead of us decline for? Sometimes it's very recipient specific issues. Somebody's not ready for transplant, whatever it is. Somebody's already getting a transplant. Um, but you get this sort of snowball effect where one person starts declining and then everybody else starts declining because they figure there's something that they're missing. You know, and so when you're in sort of situations where a liver is already out of the body and it got declined at the last minute because something happened to the recipient, it's nothing donor related. But now because you're having this decline at such a late point in time, everybody feels like maybe something happened during the OR that I don't know about and they don't want to take a chance for their patient. And so there are unfortunately a lot of organs that do go to waste because um, sort of uninformed decision making sometimes, which is really unfortunate. Um, yeah. Yeah, program outcomes are hugely important. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and if you're, well, so, so that's what the donor heart study is looking at, too, and they're trying to get really specific information, and so if somebody declines for size, there's a code for size, does that mean that the recipient was too small or too big, or, like, was it a particular measurement that wasn't good for your recipient? They're trying to get this really detailed information. Um, for the most part, that's, that's, not, that's not a really uh, realistic strategy for us to employ on a regular basis for all of the organs that we're offering all the time, just because it's we're contacting thousands of patients. Other OPOs across the US are getting thousands and thousands of offers a year. You can't talk to every single person and get all of the detailed information, but they are for hearts trying to maximize thoracic donation because there is a lower rate of thoracic donation, and so we're trying to figure out what specifically are people's concerns, and was it just a logistical issue at the transplant center that day that had nothing to do with the donor? You know, So we're just trying to get a better understanding. Um, that's, Ed, and I hate to say it, but I'm not as involved on, on the research side of things, so I'm perhaps not the... We're doing, like, a study, but it's about the outcome, right? So you, you're doing a study with the lung, um, looking at a bad outcome or a complication that happens after the surgery, so they're trying to figure out why this happened. So we'll gather all the information, the 
the donor, and then and they're actually thinking it is something about the donor's history. So that's something also, and that's an NEA study that's going on for five years with the police um, uh, to bring that together. So I think it's um, also about like the survival rate and the success of the transplant itself. So we're like looking at the donor recipient, but at the end, the recipient is the one that's staying with those organs. I mean, we do we do work with dozens of research uh, programs across the country. So anytime an organ doesn't um, doesn't get placed for transplant, we try to allocate those organs to research. Or like the liver that gets declined after after cross plant, and now everybody thinks they're missing something and it doesn't go to transplant. We try to allocate those to research too, and and so we want something good to come of it. And um, and so a lot of people are looking at different therapies for you know for patients while they're you know so hopefully to prevent transplant or looking at bridges to transplant. Um, Things like that. And, and one of the things that we did um, at Duke prior to lung cancer for cystic fibrosis patients is they actually put them on um, ECMO. Um, so they, they the ECMO was the extra cord viral membrane oxygenation that we catheter, and it was used. Uh, and many times it is used when patients are bed, in the bed, so they're sedated and they don't they they don't move. But for the CF patients, they actually put them on ECMO and walked them around. Thanks for sticking it out. I have.